Hi everyone, Mr. Stearns here. I'll make my face smaller this time. I think I like it smaller. All right, how did things go with the Eastern Silk Road? Did you get that map all drawn in there and all your notes finished and your ISN? <clears throat> make sure that's done before you move on to the Western Silk Road, okay? We're gonna follow the same pattern. I want you to really pay close attention to the different stops along the way and what people chose to trade. This is evidence folder seven, lesson 24, our independent project, section three, the Western Silk Road. I'm gonna look at this picture and I'm thinking to myself, comparing, compared to the picture I saw with the Eastern Silk Road, what do you notice that's similar? Any differences? I wonder what they trade around the Western Silk Road, on the Silk Road, on the Western part. I wonder if it's the same. Any other pictures? Oh yeah, this is, I know this is a prayer, prayer rug. We have a similar one right back here in the classroom, right on our board back there. So I know that has something to do with Islam. So religion might be important here. All right. Oh, yeah, this is critical, guys, right? You've got to have this in your map, too. So if the last one was all about places, look here, Kucha is important. Oh, here's Kashgar. This is where it ended last time. Do you remember? You had the eastern half over here. Now this is the other part to it, okay? So this is right here. Remember, they either went north up here or they went south. And then they probably went to Kashgar, which was a really important stop. And then decided to move across this way. Okay. This is the next major stop right here. I think you would say Tesafon, Tesafon, Tesafon maybe. And then Antioch is critical. You know, I see some churches around here called Antioch Lutheran Churches. I wonder if it has to do with this location in the world. I'll bet it does. Someday I'm going to stop into one of those churches and ask them. I'm interested. Okay, notice that there are more trade routes here than just the Silk Road. So they combined a whole bunch. It's kind of like highways. You don't just have a highway. You have on-ramps and off-ramps, right? Okay, so let's go back and take a look and see what the main points are. I'm looking at some of the definitions first. I know what oxygen is. Okay, main points. See how most of them are right at the beginning? Down here it changes, the pattern changes. I wonder why that is. And then it connects down here to Rome. So in the eastern part of the Silk Road where the Silk Road was made, really that silk traveled all the way along the eastern route through the western route and traveled to Rome. Not usually by one person. It would trade hands several, several times. And each time it traded hands, it would be worth more and more. They would charge more and more. It's called a middle person, okay? All right, let's go back here. Now that you've had an idea of how to set up your notes, you've got your section heading, you've got traveling, which is a subheading. I would make this a subheading as well. And then kind of indent, maybe even bullet point these underneath it. That's what I would do. What are you going to do, guys, since you're independent? Okay, I hope you have that map. All right, here we go. The Western Silk Road. Kashgar was the central trading point at which the Eastern Silk Road and the Western Silk Road met. That is critical. That's critical. Kashgar is a critical location on the Silk Road. Goods from various areas were exchanged there and sent in both directions, that way and that way, west and east. That makes sense, right? If it's in the middle, that makes sense. Okay. Traders traveling westward often carried goods by yak rather than camel. The Western Silk Road ended in the Mediterranean ports like Antioch. Well, why do you think they used yaks instead of camels? Where are camels most beneficial? Deserts, right? So if they're going to use yaks, where are yaks more acclimatated to? kind of mountains and plateaus, right? So this might be a more hilly area, which kind of makes sense, right? 
right? The, the wall of China has ended. So there's got to be deserts or something to protect people. Let's see. Traveling the Western Silk Road, which I would kind of push in in my notes a little bit because it's a subheading. And then everything blue, I would push in and bullet point a little bit more. That's how I do it. How are you going to do it? What pictures are you going to draw in your notes? Think about that. Traveling the Western Silk Road. The journey west from Kashgar began with difficult track, trek across the Pamir Mountains. Yeah, yaks would be a good thing for the Pamir Mountains, I'll bet. Some of these mountain peaks rose over 20,000 feet. Wow, that's almost double the mountains I've climbed. I've climbed a 12 and 13,000 foot mountain before, but never that high. I would need oxygen if I was going to go up that high. Travelers often, oh, here, that's exactly why you would have oxygen, because if you don't have oxygen, this is what happens. Travelers often experienced headaches, dizziness, and ringing in the ears caused by the lack of oxygen up in the elevations. Okay. Of course, the air is too thin, doesn't have enough energy or energy, oxygen. Okay. Many of the mountain passes were narrow and dangerous. Along this part of the route, sometimes called the Trail of Bones, animals and people often died. Pack animals such as donkeys may have slipped off the narrow trails and tumbled over the cliffs to their death. Sometimes traders unloaded their animals and hand carried the goods through the this area, this pass, because it was safer. They wanted to keep their animals and their goods. Okay, of course, it took longer, right? That was the downside. After the Pamir Mountains, the route took travelers through a fertile valley in what is now the country of Afghanistan. And we've talked about Afghanistan. You've seen that in the news, right? We're, our armies are over in that area right now and from the United States. And that has to do with 9-11. Then the route went across the Iranian plateau, passed south of the Caspian Sea and crossed Mesopotamia. An important stop along this part of the route was the Tesufan. That's how you say it. Tesufan in what is now present day Iraq. Tesufan was located on the eastern banks of the Tigris River, north of ancient Babylon. And we know the Tigris River, we've studied part of that. Another note, from Tesafan, the Silk Road turned north through the Syrian deserts. Now I'll bet you they wish they had camels. Travelers faced many hardships there. They were threatened by wolves, lions, snakes, and vultures. Oh no! The very goods finally reached the area known as Antioch and other Mediterranean ports. A port is a place near water where ships take on cargo and offload cargo from different places. Okay, that's what a port is. Does that make sense? Okay, so from there, they're going to go to different ports along the Mediterranean Sea and then continue trading. That sounds like a good idea. Let's go to the next subheading, goods exchanged along the Western Silk Road. And I'm kind of curious about this prayer map. Oh, this isn't a prayer mat. And I can tell because it isn't doesn't have a, a like an arrow pointing to uh, Mecca. Oh, so this is a silk carpet, not necessarily a prayer rug. Ah, that's interesting. I wonder if that's how prayer rugs started through Silk Road Trade. I don't know. Maybe. I wonder. I'm curious. Many goods traveled along the Western Silk Road and eventually ended up in China. Traders, traders from Egypt, Arabia, and Persia brought perfumes, cosmetics, and carpets. Central Asian traders brought metal items and dyes and sometimes traded slaves. Rome sent a number of products to be exchanged for Chinese silk. Now, this is important because on the test they ask, what was Rome famous for? What was China famous for? The Chinese highly valued Roman glass products. Well, what a perfect thing to trade for. They wanted silk. China wanted Roman glass products. 
These included trays, vases, necklaces, and even small bottles to hold things. They also prized a mineral called asbestos, which the Chinese used for making fireproof cloth. And we even used it up through probably the 1960s and 70s in the United States until we realized it actually caused cancer. So we've stopped using asbestos. Okay, but back in the day, they didn't know that. And they just thought it was a miracle that, yeah, asbestos, one of the good things about it is it keeps your hands safe and your other body parts from fire because it repels fire or heat. You know what I mean? But the bad part is you can breathe it in and it goes into your lungs, the little particles, which cause cancer. Uh, that can be a problem, isn't it? Okay. Chinese doctors may have also used asbestos to help treat illness believing that coral lost it. Oh, wait a minute. They also prized a mineral called asbestos, which the Chinese used to make fireproof cloth. Coral, stuff found in the sea, was also prized because Chinese doctors may have used it to help them treat illnesses, believing that coral lost its color when placed on the skin of someone who was sick. Okay? Whether that's true or not, that's something we would have to research more. Did people just guess that and think that that was true or did they have evidence? The Romans also sent massive amounts of gold and trade, gold to trade for silk, okay? So glass was worth a lot, but they, they also traded in gold. They wanted silk, which must have been really hard to get because China was almost the furthest east and Rome was almost the furthest west. So the price had to keep going up all the way because of the travel, right? Aren't we lucky to have train ships and uh, trucks in our country today? In fact, so much gold was shipped out of Rome that in the first century CE or after the birth of Christ, the Roman Empress Tiberius passed a law forbidding men to wear silk because they were losing all their gold. <laughs> they wanted silk so much they were losing all of their country's gold because they were trading it all away. Well, Tiberius, the emperor, said, enough of this foolishness. No more silk. It's going to ruin us, I'm telling you. And I don't even have any shoes to wear with it, son of a gun. Legend says that the emperor was afraid that wearing so much finery would make the Romans appear soft and weak. It is more likely that he wanted to reduce the amount of gold that was flowing out of his empire and out of his pockets. Feel me? Eastern and Western Silk Roads. This is the Western half of the Silk Road. Make sure that you know the names of the different locations. Got it? Okay. Make sure you go down below and you do your ISN. Huh, how do you do that? What's that? Oh, that's China. Who did rugs? Huh. Anyway. Go down and finish this. Make sure you write your notes, and I would definitely have a copy of this map in my notes for sure. That's what I would do, okay? Make sure you do that before we move on to the next section, which is the last section, okay? Do you see how this is like the introduction and this is like the summary? And then they divide everything up by Eastern and Western half? That would be a really good essay to write. It's really straightforward and simple. How would you answer the essential question? Have you thought about that? How about if we think about that after we go here, Mr. Stearns? You're jumping ahead too far, fast. We'll head to culture exchanges in the Silk Road, okay? All right, we'll talk to you guys soon. Bye-bye.